Hawaii. Oh my God, it's Earth Day. I'm so psyched to be here. I almost wasn't here, but that's the beauty of human travel, that we actually have airplanes and we get ourselves here, and I'm just thrilled to be here. Okay, so I have 12 minutes to take you on a journey of possibility. Let me find the clicker. I think that's this. Yeah, radical presence. Okay. Um, so I talk about this a lot around the country, uh, and I always start off with this image, and mostly the images here are of the, of the United States, but I think we can broaden this out to think about a lot of the contradictions about who we are when we have conversations about um, conservation and the environment. Uh, we, we are always talking about shifting climates, political, economic, environmental climates. We've been talking about changing demographics now for years, and I'm always saying, you know what, the demographics have always been changing. They're just a little more, I think, bringing a lot of our, um, what's, uh, been embedded in, uh, in our consciousness about who we think we are and how we are in relationship to each other and the places where we really fall down. It's just bringing them to light in a very different way. Um, I think about the fact that it is really hard for us to deal with some of our history, what's true for us. And we're finding out all the time that wherever you go, there you are, right? The history is still coming up, we're still finding it here. But this is where possibility thrives. So this isn't about me telling you, oh my God, this is so terrible. I wanna tell you, yeah, it is hard, but this is where possibility thrives. Um, there are contradictions of who we are and who we've been and who we aspire to be. And this gets our collective panties in a bunch, I know, but this is where possibility thrives. So it's about those stories, those stories of the past, the stories that are invisible, um, the stories of who we think we are, the, who we aspire to be, and who we've been. Um, it's a moment for, this moment for me is a moment for seeing and doing and being differently, for being in different relationship to the planet, for being in different relationship to each other, um, being in different relationship to our past and to this present. For me, it's a moment of convergence. It's about our past and our present and our possible futures coming together in order for us. To, it's giving us an opportunity actually to do something different. I mean, I love the idea that this is actually bringing us to a moment where there's the possibility of the emergence of something new. And what does that mean? How are we going to engage that possibility? So I want to give you just a couple of stories of what I think of as possibility. And I always have to start out with my parents, because my, my parents aren't famous. You've never heard of my parents before. But you know, this is where I want to begin um, in terms of possibility. My parents, Henry and Rose, uh, they grew up in Floyd, Virginia. They were poor, black, 12th grade education. When my dad came back from the Korean War, like a lot of black people in the 1950s, they wanted that opportunity to move north. So they came north because they believed in possibility. My dad looked for a job. He had two job offers. One, he could be a janitor in Syracuse, New York. It's about five hours north of New York City. The other was 30 minutes outside of New York City in Westchester County, a very wealthy Jewish family owned a 12-acre estate, swimming pool, lake, vegetable gardens, fruit trees. They needed full-time caretakers for that estate and a chauffeur and a housekeeper. My parents took that job. Um, they wanted to have kids. They thought they couldn't have kids, so they adopted me. And then what I like to say is that my parents relaxed and had my first brother, and then they relaxed some more and had my second brother. Um, <laughs> This is a very wealthy white neighborhood, and I just have to say that. Uh, Harry Winston has property down the street. Wingfoot Golf Club is around the corner. Schaefer of Schaefer Beer it was, lived next door at the time. Um, it, we were the only family of color in that neighborhood until the 1990s when a Japanese-American woman moved in. She has since moved out. Um, I like to tell people that I'm like, have you seen the movie Sabrina? And I'm talking about the original with Audrey Hepburn and um, Humphrey Bogart. I was like the black Sabrina, except I didn't get the rich family's son. Um, <laughs> I, you know, so my brothers and I, we played outside. It's where I learned to swim, where we learned to bike. We played outside all the time. The Tishmans were only there mostly on weekends and holidays. Um, but when I was nine years old, I was walking home from school. I was right around the corner from the house. There was always police patrolling the neighborhood because of all the wealth in that neighborhood. Um, and right around the corner, the policeman stopped me. He said, where are you going? I said, a thousand old White Plains Road, which is the address. And he said, oh, do you work there? And I'm thinking, I'm nine. And I said, no, I lived there. It was really confusing. I went home and told my parents. My father called the police station and gave them holy hell, and so they never bothered me or my brothers again. But it was at that moment I started thinking about are my possibilities limited because of somebody else's limitations and how they perceive me and how they understand me and how they think about me. 
So I'm going to jump ahead a little bit. The owners of the property, one died, one was about to die. She was very sick. What's going to happen to my parents? And it's 1990s now. They've been caring for this land for 40 years. They know this land better than anybody else. To her credit, she wanted to keep them on this land. At the time, this land was worth over $3 million. The property taxes were $125,000 a year. My dad had been making about $20,000 a year. So they weren't going to be able to stay on that property. She had a house built for them not far from here in Leesburg, Virginia. Beautiful house on a half acre of land. Miss, the, the, they died, she died, the new owners came in, my parents stayed on until about 2003. A family from the Dominican Republic took over their job. My parents moved to Leesburg. Um, my parents, particularly my father, has been depressed ever since because they talk about missing the land. They cared for that land now for almost 50 years, but had no real ownership. And that's when I wanted to start asking the question about possibility. What was, possi what was possible for us in a green world? What was possible for a, a black girl growing up in a white world in a green world? What is possible for us? So I wanted to talk to African Americans around the country and hear some really great stories of possibility. And I want to share some of them really briefly with you. The first is Mavin Betch. I love me some Mavin Betch. So Mavin Betch grew up on Amelia Island off the coast of Jacksonville, Florida in the 30s and 40s and 50s. She grew up in a very wealthy black family. Um, her great grandfather, A.L. Lewis, was the first man black or white to have a life insurance company in Jacksonville. But this was the 40s. Black people couldn't go to the same beach as white people, so A.L. Lewis thought, well, we can't go to the beach. We're just going to buy a beach. So he bought a beach on Amelia Island. He called it American Beach. You could be a black judge. You could be a black janitor. You could have a house on the beach. Um, this is where Mavin grew up, sand dunes, whales coming by on the beach. She went to Oberlin College. She decided she wanted to be an opera singer. She went to Germany. She spent a number of years there and was fairly successful. But then she became really interested in environmental causes. Uh, first, she was interested in people who were studying the um, pygmy communities in Africa. She supported a man who was studying the monarch butterfly. And then she decided to give all her wealth away to environmental causes, over $750,000. She gave it away to environmental causes. She came back to the United States. Not only did she give away her $750,000, she gave away the house that had been her grandfather's that had been bequeathed to her. So now she was living on a chaise lounge on the beach. I asked Mavine, weren't you afraid living on a chaise lounge on the beach? And she said, no, I had a big stick. Her famous sister, Jonetta Cole, got her a little house, a little trailer for her to move into. Um, Mavin started looking at the beach because people wanted to build a beach resort there because we need another beach resort. I know I'm saying that like that, but really. Um, they wanted to cut down the maritime forest. They wanted to do something to the beach. She was going to defend that. Mavin would tell me that she would go to civic meetings. She would stand in the background of every civic meeting because they'd start out with the Pledge of Allegiance. And they would say, she would say, I pledge of allegiance to the flag, to the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice. And then she'd shout out at the top of her lungs, for all white people who got money, <laughs> and all. In the end, Mavin got the Park Service to protect 8.2 acres of its sand dunes. And more importantly, I think for her, was also about protecting the African-American story in that place. It's always about people and non-human nature in place. And she thought it was important to remember that story. She believed in that possibility. I want to tell you about, oh, I love me some John Francis. I love seeing his face. So John Francis. John Francis in the 70s lived in Northern California. There was a small oil spill. He got real upset by that oil spill. So he decided that what he was going to do was not take any kind of motorized transport. He said he did that for about a week. And people got always in fights with him about it, like, why won't you get in my car? So he decided he wasn't going to talk about it anymore. John spent the next 22 years walking across the America um, and Latin America to raise environmental awareness. He did it for 17 years without talking. He got his PhD at the University of Wisconsin without talking. He started talking on Earth Day when he defended his dissertation. Um, so at this point, he's still not taking any motorized transport, but he is talking. Exxon Valdez happened. When that happened, at that time, he was the only person who had completed a dissertation on oil spills. So he got involved with creating our original oil spill policy around that. He created an organization called Planet Walk. He's taking groups of people to Cuba, had satellite systems set up so kids in Cuba can talk to kids in the United States about issues of sustainability. Uh, he's written a book about his life. Um, Hollywood's talking about making a movie about his life. This is an incredible human being who believed in the power of silence and the power of commitment over time because of how his concerns about the environment. I finally want to tell you about Brenda Palms Barber, who often when I have these conversations, people don't think about this story as being part of the environmental conversation. And for me, this is where we really have to think out of the box. Brenda Palms Barber lives in Chicago. Brenda Palms Barber was asked a number of years ago to come to Chicago because they have a lot of previously incarcerated black men and women who come out of jail and can't get a job. And so they were like, Brenda, could you come up with an idea to give these people a job, make them feel like they're part of the community? She says, yeah, I can do that. She talked to folks in the community. They thought landscape gardening might work, 
driving around the elderly, and then she was having a random conversation with somebody about beekeeping, and she said, oh, that's what we're going to do. We're going to make urban honey on the west side of Chicago, oh yes, with previously incarcerated black men and women. She would talk to me about interviewing some of these young men and women. She said she'd interview them and say, how are you doing? They'd say, fine, so you were in jail? And they say, yes, I was in jail. And she said, well, what were you in jail for? And they'd usually say something like selling drugs. And she'd pause really dramatically and say, well, were you good at it? <laughs> and usually they'd say, yeah. And they'd say, well, what were you good at? And they said, well, I understand the value of my product. I knew my customer base. And she said all those things were transferable. So she saw possibility. <laughs> Right? And these incarcerated men and women that a lot of people think are just throwaways, that have nothing to contribute, or are empty vessels. She saw possibility in them, and she saw possibility in the bees too. What she didn't know a year into running her business is that she had been running a green business and doing it intuitively. Right? She wasn't feeding her bees sugar derivatives. She was acting locally. It was only later that she found out that's exactly what she was doing. So I just want to end on this. Um, and I'm going to read this, so I, can, I want to make sure that I get it right in the time. So for me, this is what resilience, creativity, um, and love looks like. This is what possibility looks like. Possibility doesn't care if there are challenges. Possibility has attitude and denies you to, de to it, it dares you to deny its presence. Possibility thrives because it is generous. It gives us the opportunity to be more than what we know and more than what we believe to be true. We are because we care. We care because we can, and we can because we believe in the possibility of something more than our fear or the limitations of somebody else's fear. And I am because we are, and so all things become possible. And when I forget that, when I stumble over my insignificance in the face of everything that I can't control, I remember Malvine, John, and Brenda. I remember the gorilla gardener in LA, the football farmer in North Carolina, Audrey and Frank Peterman, Queen Quet, Miss Lucille. And I remember my parents who cared for someone else's land for 50 years with no fanfare and no recognition because they believed in possibility. And yes, you can say it was their job, but I will say to you that love and possibility are not bounded by our practical considerations. And anyway, the job may pay the rent, but the work makes us whole. And when we are whole, then anything becomes possible. Thank you.